What's up, future respiratory therapist? In this video, we're talking all about heat moisture exchangers. What are they? How do they work? And what are some key things you need to know about them? Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated in this video, we're talking all about heat moisture exchangers. Now, before we dive into how these uh, devices function, we first need to review normal physiology because here's what we know. The element within the, the nasopharynx, this piece of normal human anatomy plays an important role in normal everyday breathing. Not one is it just a major passageway for air to move through, but it also serves to filter inspired gas. It warms that inspired gas as well as humidifies the air that we breathe in. This is very, very important because those three things are going to be the resounding theme of this video. How do we filter, heat, and humidify gas that is, that is entering into our patients as well as coming back out? Now, the way this works normally is this. When a patient exhales, they exhale warm, moist gas. <sighs> Blow in your hand like that, and you can feel it. You'll see it for yourself. It's moist and it's warm gas. As this gas leaves the tracheobronchial tree and comes up through the upper anatomy, that heat and that moisture is captured within the nasopharynx. Now, remember, what are we going to do after we exhale? We're going to inhale. So there's going to be fresh gas that comes in through the nasopharynx. As it moves through the nasopharynx, it is going to pick up that heat and that humidity from that previous exhalation. And so the heat and the moisture is picked up and then we carry it down throughout our tracheobronchial tree. And this heating and this humidifying of gas continues all the way down past the carina. Egan's talks about this as on page 818 where it says, as inspired gas moves into the lungs, it achieves body temperature and pressure saturated conditions. This point, normally approximately five centimeters below the carina is called the isothermic saturation boundary. What we know is that warm, moist gas is appropriate and best suited for normal physiology of, of, of our alveolar units as well as keeping our, our uh, tracheal, tracheobronchial tree and our mucociliary escalator functioning normally. So we know that heat and humidity is very, very important. Now, when we look at a patient who is on a ventilator, so we have a ventilator here, a circuit, gas is coming in to the patient. Now this is an artificial airway. We know that this tube continues down into the patient's trachea, delivering gas to the lungs, right? So we know that, and then gas comes back out and then travels back out to the ventilator through the expiratory limb of of the ventilator circuit. Now, an HME, when placed properly between the circuit and the artificial airway, what it will do is the job of the nasopharynx. Because you see, we are now bypassed. This gas is not moving through this normal anatomy that is designed to heat, humidify, and filter the gas that we breathe in. So, we use an artificial nose or a heat moisture exchanger, which is where we see here. Now, this is an example of a heat moisture exchanger. This is the Paul Ultipore 100, and this is actually an HMEF. And so it serves the purpose of not just heating and moisturizing or providing heat and humidity, but it also filters inspired and expired gases to help prevent the environment from any exhaled pathogens or aerosol particles from reaching back into the room. But what happens when we put this device in between the artificial airway and the circuit Y is now as gas leaves the lungs, remember it is warm and it is moist. As this gas comes out, the heat and the moisture is gathered within the HME. As the gas moves through the HME, the HME gathers the heat and the moisture. Now the next breath coming in, the inhalation, the inhaled gas now picks up this heat and this humidity as that gas moves through 
the HME and is delivered to the patient. Okay, so that's basically how it works. It's a revolving door of exhaled gas where we capture heat and humidity and then inhaled gas picks up that heat and humidity and delivers it to the patient. Now, there are some key factors to consider when working with an HME. Time on mechanical ventilation is very, very important. All times of mechanical ventilation uh, where, where, where an artificial airway and a bypassed upper airway is, is present, should uh, that gas should be heated and humidified appropriately. And so really, anytime you think about it, uh, if you're on a transport, uh, you, should, you should be heating and humidifying that gas with an HME. If you're expecting a short-term mechanical ventilation stay, you should heat and humidify that gas with an HME. And even if it's a long-term long mechanical ventilation, expected mechanical ventilation time, there's, 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 there's little to no evidence that supports that, that an active humidifier has any better outcomes than a passive humidifier, which is what we're talking about when we talk about an HME. So an HME is a passive humidification system. Uh, a, a heater is an active humidification system. Outcomes very, very similar to those. So the points I really like to drive home are when that patient is, comes into the emergency department and they're gonna, they're, they're gonna be down there for 90 minutes to, to, to two hours, maybe sometimes three hours waiting for an ICU bed to open, why don't we start the process right there. If you're not going to use an active he heater, then then put an HME on that patient to go ahead and continue that process of proper uh, environmental uh, conditioning for that gas that is being provided to them, that that mechanical ventilation is being provided. Go ahead and heat it and humidify it for that patient during those times um, to where maybe you get to the ICU and you do switch to an active heater. Fine. Doesn't matter. But the, the short term matters as well. So all transports, all times in the ER, even paramedics and EMS crews that are bringing people in mechanically ventilated, get an HME on them so we can establish this, this, this proper environmental conditioning as soon as possible to prevent hazards associated with that. Now, the next thing here is secretions. Uh, we know that anytime we put an HME into the circuit, um, obviously secretions can pose a problem. So if you have a patient with a large amount of copious secretions, perhaps an HME is not the best device to use to heat and humidify for that patient. At least have your monitoring um, capabilities dialed in appropriately in, in, in terms of your alarms and, and your monitoring of that patient. I will tell you also that while evidence um, while, while, while theory says, yeah, that's more likely to get clogged and cause some type of obstruction, the evidence on this is very, very low that obstructions actually occur, which I think is probably a testimony to the respiratory therapists and the healthcare providers at the bedside who know when and how to manage secretions for our patients so that this obstruction or this occlusion of an HME doesn't actually become a reality. Now, the next one here is patient population. Uh, for sure, with your neonatals and your pediatric patients, if you can imagine uh, this uh, added piece into the circuitry is going to add dead space. And so when you're dealing with such small tidal volumes as you do in the neo and the pediatric population, it's a, uh, a, a very big deal. And so we're not going to see HMEs utilized in those uh, patient populations. Also, we know that uh, heat moisture exchangers can become overly saturated uh, with the humidification that is exhaled and, and, and with, the, with the delivery of aerosol therapies. This saturation can lead to an increased element of airway resistance, which might impose a greater expiratory uh, flow resistance to your patients, which when you think about that, who do we think about? COPD and asthma. So perhaps... Uh, if they're already obstructed and already have an increased resistance to expiratory flows, uh, perhaps we may not want to add any more to that. Now, proper placement is a big deal. you got to know where to put the HME. The HME is going to go between the circuit Y and the artificial airway. That is where it goes. You can't get cute here and try to put it over here on the inspiratory limb and go, oh, if I put it there, 
then it won't impose any type of expiratory resistance or I don't have to worry about secretions getting into it or anything like that. But you see, now you're defeating the purpose because we need the, the, the expiratory gas to go through it so that the inhaled gas can come back through it and pick up the heat and the moisture. So if you put it back here, you're going to be missing out on capturing the exhaled heat and humidity. So it's got to be between the artificial airway and the circuit Y as close to the patient as possible. Now, the other thing that you want to keep in mind is, okay, well, what about if I'm doing any type of additional therapeutic devices? Like, and what if I'm delivering a nebulizer treatment, right? Well, if you think about that and you say, okay, so I'm going to put the nebulizer here. So if we put the nebulizer here, then all of your aerosol is going to get captured in this humidifier, in this HME and in this filter, and none of it is going to make its way to the patient, right? So what we want to do is we don't want to put it here. We want to insert it here between the artificial airway and the HME. So now when you put your aerosol device and it's creating these aerosol particles, the gas comes through and carries it down into your patient's lung for delivery. And when exhalation happens, some of these particles may get pushed back into that HME, but guess what? They're now ready to be picked up and delivered onto the patient during the next breath. And so key things there to remember about where to put the HME and then where to put the nebulizer if you're gonna be in it, administering aerosolized medications to the patient as well, okay? So here's our key points uh, always. Appropriate humidification is vital to mimicking physiological airway environment and normal functioning of the mucociliary escalator. Dry, cold gas leads to dry mucus and it doesn't move very well. So we need to provide adequate heat and humidity for all of our patients receiving mechanical ventilation through an artificial airway to ensure that we keep that mucociliary escalator operating at a normal physiological condition. Remember, proper placement is very, very key. We just touched on that. And then always remember to think about your patient population and your disease processes um, when considering how to optimize treatment, as well as reduce risk and healthcare costs associated with various humidification devices. It's your job. You're the expert. Be the expert in understanding which devices are appropriate for which patients and know how they work. Okay, you have to know how they work. Here are the references that were used for the information within this video. And then finally, I'm Respiratory Coach. This is the Paul HMEF. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or just want to share your thoughts with me, here's where you can find me. Here we are on YouTube uh, at Respiratory Coach. Please like this video, share it, hit the subscribe button, and leave me any comments with your thoughts. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn at Joe Lewis, and then finally send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com if you ever have any questions about anything related to respiratory therapy. I'm here to help. Hey, remember at the end of the day, average is easy. Don't be it.